video, we'll take a look at the most recent information that you've read on natural selection and mutations. But first, let's do a quick review. In the introduction, they told us that evolution has essentially three definitions, change over time, universal common descent, and the creative power of natural selection as a source of that change. Our focus is mainly on definitions two and three, as the first definition is a very simple one, one that we can observe and is not contested. So taking a look at natural selection, Darwin's theory, essentially this is survival of the fittest, where in a population there must first be some sort of difference or variation, and then that variation has to be something that's genetically based, uh, something that can be passed from parent to offspring, so we say that there's heritability. And finally, there has to be some sort of struggle for existence, something that um, creates a situation where not all individuals survive so that one particular trait has a competitive advantage over another and as a result those with that advantage are the ones that survive and because they survive they reproduce and then passing on those traits we see a shift in the group as a whole so change in population over generations that is the basic theory that darwin proposed as a source of change in organisms and how new living things could evolve. So again, this week our primary focus is on just what kinds of change can natural selection produce, um, what essentially what is that creative power. And so the response to that in the theory uh, says that natural selection acts on those traits that are favorable, but how do you get new information, how do you get new traits to emerge, and the reply to that is through the process of mutation. That's what the theory proposes. And so just a quick review of what we have learned about DNA. We know that a mutation is simply a random change in DNA. Um, so if you change the sequence, uh, you're changing the information. And as soon as you do that, you change the protein that's produced. And then as a result, the function and possibly um, that could be a change in appearance or a change chemically within an organism. And so as we look at types of mutations, there can be something that can be a relatively small scale change, um, or there can be a, a mutation that could actually produce a rather large change in terms of the anatomy of the organism. So is it a small change that's happening on a molecular level or is it something that actually produces new body parts? And so one classic example that's used a lot to support the idea that mutations could actually be helpful and can lead to evolution is within bacteria. So bacteria, quick review, those are prokaryotes, very simple life forms, unicellular, very small. And um, the, the natural form of bacteria is to be um, affected or killed by antibiotics. So they um, sometimes will have a random mutation that allows them to become resistant to the antibiotics that we take um, to try to fight them. And so that mutation, again, is just a random event and it's a point mutation, a small change that affects the protein structure that um, prevents an antibiotic from attaching onto the active site, and so then prevents the antibiotic from working to kill that bacteria. So if you were to take antibiotics and this random mutation had already happened, what, would, what we would see is that those um, regular bacteria would be killed, so those would die off, and only those that had that mutation already would be the ones that would survive. Again, because they're the ones that are surviving, they're the ones that then reproduce. And so over time, we see the bacteria numbers go up, and we see that they are the ones that have this new mutation. And so there's been a shift in the bacteria population. And so as a result, we've seen many cases of this where bacterial strains have become resistant 
to the medicines that we have used historically and they've become harder and harder to fight and so this has become a, a really serious health problem and um, so this is definitely something that we have witnessed and we know that it occurs. But what's interesting about this is that kind of like the example we looked at with sickle cell anemia, what seems to be a beneficial mutation isn't 100% beneficial. There's actually some health consequences. So again, remember the sickle cell example. To carry the gene for sickle cell anemia, helps you to be resistant to malaria. So if you live in somewhere where there's malaria present, you actually have an advantage. Carrying the allele or the gene for sickle cell does not have an advantage if you are in an area without malaria because there's actually some health consequences of having those sickle-shaped blood cells. So it's kind of this, this um, very delicate balance of there's a little bit of bad effects, but there's also a short-term benefit. The back, this bacteria example is a lot like that. So in the short term, these bacteria that have this mutation have an advantage. They don't get killed by the medications that we try to use to um, fight the infection. However, in the long term, what we see is because that mutation has changed protein structure, it also affects some the functioning of those proteins and affects the ability of the bacteria to carry out normal vital functions. So as soon as you take away the antibiotics and you allow the regular bacteria to come back, they actually out-survive the mutant um, bacteria. And so what we find is that in the end, the original bacteria actually survives better as long as there are no antibiotics present. And so um, as a result, at the beginning, we start with regular bacteria, and in the end, we end with regular bacteria. There's really no overall evolutionary change that occurs because, again, even though there was a short-term advantage while the antibiotic were was present in the long term, um, those bacteria really, it wasn't a newer, stronger, like new and improved bacteria cell. There were some disadvantages associated with those mutations. And this is an interesting quote just about bacterial um, science that's been done. And so over 150 years, we have studied bacteria and we've grown bacteria. And there's no evidence that one species has changed into another. So here is an organism that has a really, really short generation time. We can reproduce them very quickly. And, and we've done lots of observations of these types of mutations. And so even within all of that, we don't see new species of bacteria forming. And so it's interesting. Um, there seems to be some a li a limit. Um, in place in terms of the amount of change that takes place. So those were examples of molecular level or small scale mutation changes. This is an example with the, the fruit fly, one that is cited um, quite a bit as an example of how a mutation can actually produce whole new body parts, appendages, some rather large anatomical changes in an organism. So if you look at a normal fruit fly, we see that they have got um, two pairs of wings, or sorry, one pair of wings, two wings, um, and then behind those wings are these small structures called balancers. So what was done is taking the fruit fly, inducing mutations, and those balancers then actually became wings. And so through mutation, you're taking a fly with two wings and turning into a fly with four wings. So what often isn't cited, however, are some of the details of this experiment. So in order for these new wings to form, this was not a random mutation that happened spontaneously like we see in the bacteria. This is something that was carefully 
um, orchestrated and engineered within these flies. And it wasn't just one mutation, it was three separate mutations and over three generations. So this is not something that we see in the wild. So it's not this spontaneous random event like we see in bacteria. And the other thing that usually isn't mentioned is that with this second set of wings, um, they're not actually functional. So balancers are used for um, just support in, in balance as a fly is moving through the air. And so there's no actual muscles attached there. Um, so when these uh, new wings are produced, there's no muscle there to move them. And so this fly ends up having um, this extra set of wings that have actually no flight ability. And so the fly is um, left without the ability to fly because here's this dead weight just hanging on it. So as a summary, we have seen mutations happen. Um, and in the short term, they can appear to have some sort of functional advantage like with the bacteria. But in the long term, we see a fitness cost, some sort of health detriment associated with them so that um, the regular natural form of the, the bacteria is actually um, able to outcompete and outsurvive the ones with the mutation. And then looking at the fruit flies, Again, these mutations didn't happen in the wild, and these flies that are produced as a result of these engineered mutations cannot survive in the wild because they can't fly. So the question then is how could something like that evolve if the ones that, that are produced as a result have no survivability? In the wild, they wouldn't make it. They can't fly. And and so overall, we see that mutations um, really seem to have some sort of harmful effect, some sort of impact on life function. And so then the question is, um, can mutations really be the source of all the new variation and new body plan, all of the new information that would be required to um, allow a simple organism like a bacteria to evolve into something that is fundamentally different. So that concludes um, this section on natural selection and mutations. Thank you.